All right, I thought I'd do a quick update on the Suzuki project. Um, all right, let's, here we go. So uh, I think I, in my last video, I posted how I had done. Uh, I had started ordering parts, or maybe I didn't. I'm not sure, but I did. So what I've ordered so far, and they're supposed to be here next week. I got front and rear fender. I'm replacing this uh, side cover. Is it in here? Not in there. I'm replacing the side cover that goes here uh, because the original one is cracked. And while I can still get a factory pre-painted new old stock part, I'm gonna do it. So it's got a crack here. Yeah, I could fix this if I had to, um, but I don't have to. I can get a new one. And it was like 20 bucks. So hey, whatever. Um, I ordered a new front brake cable. I've ordered um, a couple of little bits and pieces of hardware that are not so healthy. A new rectifier. Um, I did test the old one and it passed, but the reality is I added it to my cart and then I realized that I can test it with a multimeter and I forgot to take it out of the cart. It was 15 bucks, so I have a spare. I'm going to put the new one in and take the spare one and uh, shove it somewhere. I've got the, um, I believe the little window on the oil canister is leaking, so I ordered a new window kit. There's a little sight glass that goes right here, and that is replaceable, so I'm going to replace it. <laughs> so, it was a couple dollars. I've ordered, oh, you can no longer buy shocks for this bike. Yeah, you heard me. You cannot buy shocks for this bike. You have to measure them out and dig high and low through the interwebs and you can find them, but they're not factory shocks and they may or may not fit, but they were $26 on eBay. The front shocks in this thing are completely toast. There is absolutely, and how can you tell if they're bad? Well, let's take it off the kickstand real quick. And I'll tell you how. Oh yeah, the handles are loose because I loosened them. And I think my my kickstand might be bent too. I gotta fix that. See, there's there's no rebound, so when you're float when you're driving along the road, it kind of floats. It drives like a it drives like a, an Oldsmobile Delta 88 without shocks. So there's no there's no dampening. I'm sorry. There's no um. Yeah, there's no dampening at all in the front shocks. You've got the springs and that's it. The rear, you can still hear a little bit. You can hear the, the like some air in there. So there's something there, but it's pretty much toast. Now, obviously the shocks aren't bad because of mileage. Shocks can go bad because of age. The seals dry out. The fluid leaks out. These are hydraulic, I believe. Hydraulic dampening. The fluid leaks out of them. And there's nothing there. That's generally how they go bad on these. Not because of mileage. Uh, because, let's face it, nobody puts 80,000 miles on a moped. Uh, some do, might. Some might. Some might. I'm not one of them. But anyway. So, yeah. So, those are... Those are all getting replaced. I'm going to do the front ones first. The rear is easier to find. And these are just standard shocks. You can buy them by size, and they're pretty universal. So we'll see how that goes. Um, parts that I've ordered. What have I ordered? Ah, a complete air cleaner assembly. That is on order. And because this one is damaged, it's discolored, and I'm done with it. So... Okay, plans for the future. Um, so the handlebars, I was considering having these replated, but I'm going to let them go a little longer before I do that. They look good from this angle. I just cleaned them up with some WD-40 and quadruple zero steel wool, and they cleaned up pretty well with the exception of the back side, where the pitting is still very evident. But I think I can get some more life out of them. We'll see what happens. Um, I contacted a local plating surface service uh, that is actually not far from my house. It's literally on the way to work. I could just pull off and drop them off and have them done. But he quoted me $260. You heard me right. $260. 
to have them plated. I'm like, are you, they're not gold. Why so much? I found a place on the internet based on a, a on a, um, a forum post that I found where there was a guy that was charging around a hundred bucks to do a set of handlebars. So I may ship them off for a hundred bucks. I'll do it. If I keep it, if I keep it, if I decide to sell this sucker, no, I'm not doing that. Um, and if I sell it, I've already lost money, I promise you. <laughs> even even though I've only put $300 into it so far. Um, so yeah, just a couple of odds and ends. Now, I'm going to need to buy two tires. Now, these are available still. Um, I'm going to go with the tire that's in the back. These are kind of knobby. This is more of a trail bike tire. And I think that's a good look for this machine, even though it's not that practical for city cruising. I don't know. Maybe I'll buy the... I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll think about it, how I want to use this machine, if I do. Uh, because remember, I still am a little wary about going out on the road on something like this, because not only is it, well, basically <laughs> the smallest bike you can legally drive, but it's... Um, I'm still a little bit nervous about my accident, and, you know... I'm really doing this just to keep my, my hands busy, and it's winter, and boredom is setting in, so this is, that's what this is for, really. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen with it. I don't know if I'm going to sell it. I don't know if I'm going to use it or give, not give it away, but I don't know. We'll see what happens, so, so stay tuned. Um, hmm. Oh, a couple of more, a couple of other things. So I've been looking at original ads for this bike, and... In the original ads, it's shown without directionals. I believe this machine was built without directionals from the factory, or that was the intent, and to satisfy American requirements or other countries for, um, that require directionals um, for mopeds or as a factory option. Um, they fitted it with these. Now, these are definitely pretty much universal. Um, they do not say Suzuki on them, on any part of them. And, I mean, they're Stanley lenses, so they're definitely Japanese. But, um, you know, these are pretty much universal. Uh, these are, yeah, I think these are, I think they're, um, yeah, for lack of a better word, I think they're aftermarket. I, I don't know if they're they're a, a factory option or if they're aftermarket, but nothing about them says Suzuki. Unless some of you some of you might have an answer for this, but you know, like this this turn signal switch. Normally they're integrated, you know, into here, but clearly that wasn't the case with these. Um, so it's a separate turn signal switch, and if you look at how it's wired, it's not wired like a normal. I mean, look at this. So normally there'd be bullet connectors here, uh, at least on most bikes that I've worked on. But this is soldered and shrink tubed with a, a sealed shrink tube. This is good quality stuff. But, I mean, do you really think that the factory would have done that? You know, they tapped it off of... Um, it's pretty simple wiring. But yeah, it's, it's tapped off of this... Uh, is that a ground wire? I'm not even sure where that goes. Let's see if we can figure it out. A little sleuthing here. Where does it go? Underneath the oil-covered oil tank. Yeah, there's two black wires. And... Oh, yeah. That's exactly what they did. It's Yeah, so this wire goes to the back. Turn signal and nowhere else. It's yeah, this is like totally rinky dink wiring here. But it's been there for it's probably been there since this was a new machine. So that's interesting how they how they did that. It's just like spliced wires and it's done in a professional way. But yeah, so <laughs> this is where a bullet connector would be. So you can't in order to remove these turn signal uh uh, units, you have to cut wires. So I don't, I don't think that's factory. So this other wire, where does that go? That ties into this green wire here, which probably, I bet you, comes off of the turn signal switch. And check this out. 
you know, this is the uh, turn signal relay that they used. And I think that's what that is. But yeah, this is such rinky-dink wiring, I can't even tell you. I mean, it doesn't look like, you know, handy homeowner special or anything. It just looks rinky-dink. The best way I can describe it. A lot of splices. Like, for what reason? If it was truly factory, it wouldn't have been done that way. And that turn signal switch, where does that go? Yeah, it's like a kit. I remember... Um, when I was a little kid, my neighbor had a, uh, a 1970, I think it was a 1977 uh, Pook Maxi. And he also had a, um, like one that looks like a motorcycle. I don't know what model it was. It was a Pook, which is an Austrian bike, for those of you who don't know. Um, <laughs> they're... Um, yeah, so he had a, he had another another one that was it, it resembled it had like a top uh, uh, sen, um, sorry a top bar tank like a motorcycle would, but it they both had these aftermarket turn signal kits installed and I think one of them was battery powered like it actually required you to charge the battery to use them, and uh, so the the charging system wasn't designed to run such a such a uh, an extravagance. Um, so I believe a lot of these did not require them, and they were designed from the factory not to have turn signals. But if you wanted them or needed them for your, your local laws or your country laws, they would just add something like this. And that's what I think this is. But if you look at the later ads, they started mounting the, the front turn signals on the handlebars. There was a, a lug welded to the bars for the turn signals, which also satisfy the, the American requirements that they be um, so many inches apart. Whereas these are very close together, um, would not meet U.S. requirements today. I thought that was interesting and I thought it was worth mentioning. But yeah, this relay is... I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't look factory to me. There's no Suzuki part number. Who makes it? C-H-W-E-I and Schwen. It's a Schwen Long. Schwen Long. Long Schlong. Schlong Schlong. Yeah, this is all cracked to hell. There's no place for this to go. It doesn't mount anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. So, Oh, in other news. Oh yeah, also ordered a new headlight. Now there's one of these headlights for sale on eBay for like $90 or something like that. The dealers only charge $30 or so for the headlight. So just so you know, they're not unobtainable yet, and they're not that expensive. Um, of course, I haven't gotten the replacement yet, so I could be eating my words. I may end up having to fit my own headlight to this thing. I mean, if it gets to that point, I'm, I'm probably going to just cut my losses and get rid of it. But anyway, because <laughs> I don't want to have to rinky-dink Mickey Mouse anything. I love that word, rinky-dink. I don't know why. Um, so, speedometer, yes. Now, this is a part that you literally can't buy anymore. Um, and you'll notice that I've added something. These little straps here, see those? Those little metal straps? I made those. Those are my own design. The, um, the way this unit is designed, the way the... Uh, the, the and I'm going to seal that, by the way, with silicone. But the way the, uh, the, the uh, speedometer assembly is built, which looks like the speedometer off my great-grandmother's exercise bike, by the way. Um, not the highest of quality. Uh, but yeah, the way it's designed, um, if the plastic gets old and brittle and you hit a bump, the entire innards of the speedometer will actually fall out. It'll, it'll break the little clips that hold it in place. And that's what happened to this one. So what I've gone and done is um, the previous owner tried to use duct tape to seal it up. Duct tape doesn't work for anything. It's useless. Don't ever use it for anything. Seriously, guys. Duct tape sucks. And um, I've never found a practical use for it. Um, but, uh, yeah, holding a speedometer together is definitely not what I would consider a practical use for duct tape. That reminds me, I gotta do a stop drill bit hole on that. That's, that crack's gonna get bigger. Looks like it already has. 
you can uh, you can prevent cracks from getting bigger by stop drilling them if it gets high, under stress they can get larger stop drilling it means you just drill a hole at the very end of the crack and what that does is it it um, it stops the crack from spreading and then you fill it in with epoxy or something which is what I need to do so I got some work to do on that that's 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 in the in the works um yeah also going to replace the um going to replace the handlebar grips I'm going to look at powder coating the engine case halves the exterior covers not the engine case itself but the the side covers I'm going to have those powder coated because paint doesn't hold up um trying to find ways to do things at a, at a, on a budget but it's it's going to get expensive and uh, so we'll see what happens. I'm already 300 bucks into it. I paid nothing for the Vespa, so I didn't lose any money there. This is going to come together nicely. It's going to be a fun little toy. That's all it is, you know, if I ever decide to ride it. And I just noticed these uh, mirrors don't match. <laughs> One is longer than the other. What the hell? I mean, they're the same mirror, but one is curved and one's not. Don't know why that is. Do they stick out the same distance? Oh, that's weird. I wonder why that is. I wonder if there's a reason for it. Huh. Fun stuff, guys. Fun stuff. But look at this paint. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely savable. Definitely savable. Well, all right. Well, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you for watching, and stay tuned for more work, more stuff, more fun. Oh, before we close for the day, before I before I, I uh, bid you guys a good night for our officialness, uh, I want to take a look at the original seat. Let's see what that looks like. I'm kind of curious. I realized that the... <clears throat> ah, come on. I realized that the seat cover just slips on. And there we go. So the seat cover is just a slip on. Um, you can buy these on eBay and they're really not expensive. But it should come right off. Let's take a look. Let's, uh, let's see what happens here. I kind of wonder what the original seat looked like. Now I thought this might have had a white seat, but it looks like it's black. Looks like it, uh, it was originally black. So. Let's see how bad it was. What triggered the purchase of this seat cover? Which fits quite nicely. Oh, okay. Alright, uh, that's not too bad. I mean, that's bad, but... I mean, all the foam is there, and that's what really matters. So this thing was pretty beat up. You know, it's funny how when you buy something like this and you look at the pictures and then you quick do a quick look over of it or glance over of it and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, it looks nice. Probably really well cared for, sat in a garage for all its life. And then you start digging deeper. You start taking covers off, you start looking inside things and you realize, oh shit, <laughs> definitely not what I thought it was. But yeah, check this seat out. I mean, this is, it's all there. It's just cracked. Yeah. It's all, the foam is still plushy. Not bad, not bad. There's that duct tape again. <laughs> oh, they use black duct tape. They use the fancy stuff on that. Get that off, because that shows up in the new seat cover, you know? You can see that there was something there. We'll get that out of there. Okay. But yeah, not too bad. I actually thought about buying a white seat cover for it, but I, I think it's a waste of money at this point because this one looks pretty good. What I might do, though, is actually spray it with, um, uh, there are special adhesives for upholstery, and it'll, it'll allow the seat cover to better adhere to this, but I, I think that's a little, I don't think that's necessary. I, I think it's, 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 it's fine just the way it was. So I'm going to put it back on, but I just wanted to take a look and see what uh, what horrors lie beneath? Because I've seen some pretty bad seats on on, uh, on older bikes, and this isn't really that bad. It's you know, not, not beautiful, but 
Not bad. The seat pan on this appears to be plastic. That's what it looks like. No, that's metal. Yeah, that's metal. It's just in really good shape. There's not a lot of rust here. It's clean. So, good times. Alright, well, that's it. Thank you for watching. Oh yeah, you guys, you got to realize that with my videos, it's not over till it's over. Uh, I realized that I wanted to do a compression test and take a look at the spark plug and see what we're dealing with. Um, it's, uh, these are very important things to do when you're feeling out a, in a, a new acquisition, such as something like uh, we have here. It will give me an idea as to how worn out the engine is and... Uh, you know, just kind of where it sits right now. What I need to do, where I need to focus my attention. Uh, I, I suspect it's burning a little oil. That's a joke. Laugh. Okay. Um, normally a compression test is done on a warm engine. We're doing it on a cold engine. I just want to see what I get. So let me get the stuff set up and we'll, we'll start rolling. Okay, so I have the uh, plug wrench here. See if I can position my camera so you can see. Okay. To see, uh, you know, one thing you can tell with a two-stroke, at least, by looking at the plug, is whether it's running lean or rich. And that plug is certainly dirty um but not worn it's got an ngk bp 4 hs i don't see a lot of coke and carbon on that that's a good sign i think uh, it's definitely getting oil um <laughs> uh, all right let's get the compression tester in there and see what we got i think it's going to have a range of um yeah, there, there is an acceptable range. I couldn't find anything in the manual. I actually do have the service manual. It's in PDF format. Um, let's see. One of these adapters is going to fit. Is it this one? Please be this one. No, it's not that one. Best purchase ever, by the way. Is, uh, these little kits because um, they're very handy. All right, looks like it's going to be the big one. Yeah, that's going to be it right there. So we're going to put the adapter in to the uh, to the uh, spark plug hole. Thread that sucker in there. Come on, find the thread first. That's the right one. How many other adapters do I have? Seems to be up there. There we go. Let me get that in there. Get it nice and snug. I think the the range is pretty uh pretty wide. And if it needs a rebuild, that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, almost. Oh, that's not gonna fit that. Yeah. Let's just get it hand tight. Um. I'm not terribly worried uh, because I was kind of planning on a rebuild anyway on this one. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of miles. It's only got 3,000 miles on it, so I don't think it's going to be that bad. Uh, when you start getting them, you know, into the, uh, you know, over you know, six, seven, ten thousand miles or more, you know, that's when you're going to start getting low numbers. Or, if the oil injector wasn't doing its job and it was running on low oil, well, then you're going to have a problem. So, let's get... Come on. Ah, so, the plug is oil-soaked. That could be from uh, just me running it or trying to kick it over to make sure that uh, there was no fuel left in it. Get the compression gauge hooked up. And now, I'm going to start kicking it over with the throttle wide open. And you're going to see that needle rise up. After a few strokes, it should be it should be it then. I have to snug up the uh, handle that I loosened earlier. And uh, 
if you want to open the throttle completely, these have to be done on a warm engine with an open throttle. We're kind of breaking the law here by doing it on a cold engine, but that's okay for this demonstration. It's not going to start. <laughs> Don't worry about that. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah, a little clutch. Not terrible. Uh, it is about a hundred. Again, cold engine. So you got a hundred, let's see, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110 pounds. Now that that's not terribly high. <laughs> it's not terribly low either. I believe the range is a hundred, or it's gotta be between 90 and a buck thirty, so. I remember on my Honda Helix, we'll do another test. I'm going to just tighten this up a little more, just to make sure. When I had my Honda Helix, the compression on that sucker was somewhere in the, uh, I want to say it was about 195. But that was also a 250cc engine, you know, but it had 40,000 miles on it too, so, you know. But it was also a better engine. You gotta factor that in. So open the throttle, pull on the clutch, here we go. In fact, this time I'm gonna look at the gauge myself and then I'll tell you what the reading is. Because you're supposed to, whenever it stops moving, that's when you, that's when you quit. So that's eight compression strokes. And we got it a little higher this time. Uh, 90, but no, we got it at right 110 on the nose. So that's, where we're, that's our starting point. So now with the engine hot, I'm gonna have to do this again with a hot engine and see how that compares. But so far, I'm not disappointed. But oh yeah, that wasn't, I, I, I said eight compression strokes, that was, uh, eight kicks so it's different um, now on a four stroke a compression stroke is every other revolution on a two stroke it's every revolution but let's get another look at this plug it is uh it's definitely got some oil on it but it looks good it doesn't look terribly old um i'm gonna replace it i'm gonna buy i gotta buy a couple of these you always want to have a spare plug on a two stroke um, because they can foul out, they can coke up, and then you can have major problems. But I uh, don't anticipate that. I'd like to actually get a look inside that, uh, that uh, get a good look in there and see how coked up it is. Um, it should be torn apart and decarbonized anyway, but you know. So that's it for now. I am I am absolutely realizing that I'm in for a world of hurt on this. This is going to be expensive. It's getting expensive. Uh, the more I look at it, the more I see what it needs. You know, and I look at what these are selling for, and it's it is depressing. Um, where is my flashlight? I don't know where. Uh, well, not, I have yeah. I don't want this one. I want the little one. But yeah, it is it is a bit discouraging. Oh, there it is. Because, you know, they aren't worth a lot of money. You know, mopeds are just not. They're just not. And, you know. Yeah, it's pretty carbony. You can see that. Yeah. Yeah, it should be cleaned. Definitely. Now, the other thing is carbon can artificially raise the compression results. So, because what happens is, as carbon builds up in the combustion chamber, the effective quench size, or the amount of space available for quenching, or the quenching space, is it quenching, or is it, I think that's the word they use, 
the um, not quenching the um, the amount of space in the combustion chamber available for air to compress. Yeah, uh, it reduces. It it becomes smaller, and when that happens, the air is compressed more than it would normally be. So what that does to you is um, it gives you a false high reading. So if you have an engine that has a higher compression ratio, like exceptionally higher than what it should be, or what you're expecting, then that could be the, the cause of it. You know what I mean? So I didn't just cross thread that, did I? No. No, I'm not that stupid. No, I, I threaded it in almost all the way, right? But yeah, um, that, would, that would be the day, huh? I've never cross-threaded a spark plug in my life, and I don't want to start now. No, no, it's good. It's good. It was just... You know, I think... Yeah, it's, it's, it's in there, right? Yeah. So, once you decarbon the, pist the, uh, the cylinder and the combustion chamber, or the piston top and the combustion chamber, then you do another compression test, and you may find it to be slightly lower. Um, in which case, you know, if it's not within spec, then, yeah, time for a rebuild, pal. Uh, <laughs> as long as it's within spec, then you're good. But if it's not, then you're in for a rebuild, absolutely. But the thing about two-stroke engines is rebuilds are a fact of life. It's just what you do. I mean, these engines are only good for, shit, maybe 10,000 miles to be within spec, depending on driving conditions and other factors, but, you know, getting 10,000 miles out of a 50cc, hell, a, even a four-stroke, but a two-stroke especially, that's a lot of miles for these engines. That's why they only have four digital odometers, because they're just not built for longevity. They really aren't, and that's something you've got to know before you start dumping money into one of these. However, because of that, and because there are so many of these still around, parts are very easy to get, usually, if it's a common engine type. Um, this engine was used in several Suzuki models, so there are plenty of rebuild kits available for the top end. The bottom end should be good for like 20,000 miles or maybe. I'm just a rough guess. I'm actually basing that on four-stroke numbers. The bottom ends on these are probably good for maybe 10 to 15,000 miles. But um, that's why in between rebuilds, you want to definitely tear the engine completely down, check all the bearings, make sure everything is nice and smooth and not worn or notchy or loose. What also can happen on these two-stroke engines, um, you know, these use ball bearings and they spin at high revolutions. So... What can happen is, you know, you can have a bearing that's just starting to go, and you don't even know it, until it explodes. <laughs> and when that happens, and they do explode, I mean, not, not like in the, in the, um, not like in a, in a movie or anything, but the bearings can slip or miss, they can, they can jam up, and those bearings go flying into the crankcase, the, uh, the crank goes off center and it causes internal damage it, it's it's as bad as it sounds it can cause major damage to the engine casings which is why it's always good to err on the cautious side and whenever you've got the motor apart just replace the main bearings you know replace the, or the crank bearings replace all the seals because the other thing is on a two-stroke the crankcase is part of the intake and if there's an intake leak, the engine can run leak, uh, can run um, lean, and you can actually cause excessive damage. You can even seize the engine that way. So these engines are finicky. They're not meant for longevity. They're meant to be cheap, light, and fast. That's it. Cheap, light, and fast. Not reliable. Uh, <laughs> but generally, when they're running right, they are reliable. It's just they, they tend to wear down. Um, yeah, so a, a moped like this with a fresh top end, a fresh bottom end, 
you know, it's it's actually, you know, it'll be good for maybe 10,000 miles. But now that it's got 4,000 on it already, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to pull the motor down, and I'm just going to go right through it, make sure everything is good, replace what needs to be replaced. It's going to cost me a few bucks, but in it for a penny, in it, in it for a, for a pound, does that go? In it for a penny, in it for a pound, or something like that. Penny pound, dollar foolish. I don't fucking old cliches, but you get the point. I already know that this rear bearing is probably not good. <laughs> I can feel movement there. Now the wheel could be loose, but I don't think so. I think there's a final drive or axle bearing that's bad. That should not there should not be play side to side like this. You can actually see the movement there. Ah, that's not good. And that's not that's not just the shaft moving in and out. That is a um, that is an eccentric movement, or um, there's a word for that. Yeah, yeah, I can feel it. So, and, and that and that just goes to show that at such low miles, you can already have problems like that. Now, I, if I was just beating on it, I could probably make it last a little while, but you know. Um, the nearest store from where I'm sitting right now is about 15 miles away. You know, so even the shortest distances, well, not 15 miles, more like 5 to 10. But, no, literally though, it, it's, you know, this thing's going to see some miles if I end up using it for anything. Um, so stuff like this really needs to be addressed. The front wheel's okay, but the rear one, not so good. That tells me that there could be additional wear and tear inside that transmission that I don't see, that I can't hear, that I can't feel yet. So these things can get expensive and problems can, little problems can become even bigger problems uh, if left alone, mostly in the bearing sense. But yeah, the compression on this motor is a little on the lower side, um, but not, I believe for this engine that's not too shabby. But I'm going to rebuild it anyway, whole top end, and it'll be a big bore kit. Can't wait to do that. All right, well, that's it for now. We're done.